We're cutting some bracing to place in the back of that old buffet we picked up last week at the estate sale. It was in need of structural repair. Just a few more cuts and we'll be good to go. All right. You can slowly bring down the circular saw sound effect. I was just having fun with you guys. Actually, that was strategic as today we are spending time talking with Lynette of Superb Curb Refurb about using power tools with an emphasis on power cutting tools in your refinishing shop. We'll start off discussing one of her pieces that was featured on our social media venues for Zebra Drama. We also get to hear from Jen with Perfectly Imperfect Furniture Restoration as she answers a question in our Ask a Refinisher segment. Grab some hot chocolate and your favorite zebra paintbrush and enjoy today's episode of Zebras Before and After. I'm your host, Lane Ball. Today's Zebra Spotlight segment is with Lynette of Superb Curb Refurb. Lynette was selected for our zebra painting Instagram and Facebook zebra drama on October 23rd. She had transformed an old ugly dresser into a new up-to-date in the no dresser if you see the before you'll say wow like we did as we always say it definitely met the criteria of dramatic which is why it received the zebra drama hi lynette thanks for joining us today hi lane thanks for inviting me tell us where you are located on the map lynette i'm in virginia and i'm actually right on the coast in virginia beach on the almost the border of north carolina all right, North Carolina, that's nice. <laughs> I wonder why I'm cheering North Carolina on here. Well, now, if you're at Virginia Beach, you're not too far from Chesapeake Bay? Correct. We're probably 10 minutes oh, from wow, the bay. Oh, really? And maybe half a minute from the ocean. <laughs> oh, my goodness, man. You've got an ideal location for sure. <laughs> I've got a friend that uh, been a friend for many years and his family has a place up on Chesapeake Bay and he's actually invited us to come up and it just didn't work out this year, but I'm hoping we can make it up next year because I've never been. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that at some, some point soon. My favorite is that right across the bay in the Eastern shore, that's, that's where I love to go. You've got a lot of options here for you, don't you? <laughs> yes, a lot. <laughs> I think you're making people jealous right now. <laughs> So we just were hit by Hurricane Zeta and then it went north and you guys felt the effects as well. Do you, any damage where you're at? No, no damage. We had some pretty severe thunderstorms last night, lots of rain and wind, but that's kind of what happens here a lot. So, but it's just still really windy today. Fortunately today, um, it's sunny and nice. It's, it's, well, it's gotten chilly. It's funny. It's funny because I think it's around 60 today. Yesterday was like 81. And that yesterday is when Hurricane Zeta came through. It caught us by surprise because the wind damage was, was pretty bad in our area. I mean, there were big trees that came down, power lines. And so we were without power all day yesterday. And a lot of people in our area are still without power. Fortunately, I haven't heard of any injuries. So, so that's good news. Yes, that's fortunate. Fortunately, we didn't lose power either. So, <laughs> isn't it funny when you lose power? You're like, the world's coming to an end. I mean, what? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it it just it, it's always interesting because you realize how much you rely on and how important power is. I mean, it's just uh, you live like back in the the uh, 1800s when you <laughs> when you lose Pioneer power. Pioneer day. We call exactly. it Pioneer Day. <laughs> yep, that's right. You just have to be prepared for Pioneer Day. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so, what has your fall been like there? Actually, we have spring, summer, and fall all day long. And today we're in the low 60s again, just like you. So it's sweater day here. But um, we don't really, we have a pretty mild winter, not much snow or anything like that. But yesterday it was in the 80s here as well. Today it's 20 degrees different. So it's just going to kind of be like this for the next month, probably. It's that transition period, and sometimes that can be hard on the bones. <laughs> you <can> feel <laughs> True. those major, major changes and shifts in the in the barometric pressure and in the temperatures. So, how has your business been this year? My business, unbelievably, has been so good, and I was so thankful when COVID started. I was so worried, mm-hmm. but it was almost like it just helped my business. People couldn't get out. People were bored, and I felt like people really bought more because they really didn't have anything else to do. So fortunately, it's been good. 
Yeah, that's that's the good news. Just a few people have noticed a downturn, but I think most people, I suppose it just depends on where you live and how the pandemic has affected that particular area. But I'm glad to hear you're, you're doing well and your business is up. We'll, we'll dive into a discussion on your dresser that received zebra drama in a bit. But before we do that, I thought our listeners would enjoy hearing you talk a bit about your camper makeover. So you guys, <laughs> you guys bought this to flip? No, we bought it to actually use for our personal okay. use, but it could turn into an Airbnb maybe yeah. next year. Well, so that's kind of the plan um, all along was to get something to use as a side business. It's a lot of fun because, you know, you took the before pictures, you show the before and then to see what you've done with it, um, it, it would be a cool Airbnb for sure. Well, I will say it was a lot more work than I thought it was going to be because it's such a small (laughs) space and I can't even think, I think it's been three weeks, but yes. So we kind of designed it so that it would be easy for our family to stay. And we have so many nice places here for camping that I thought it would work out well. You, I mean, you made some incredible improvements. Uh, Thank you. What was the most frustrating part of the makeover Like I said, I think just the size of it, and it just seemed to just go on forever because it's so small inside. But um, the most frustrating is that it's even less straight than a house. (laughs) (laughs) So nothing is straight in there, and there's curves, and that made some things even more difficult. But in all, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. That's really interesting that you say that because I've never even thought of that. We have a little pop-up camper that we bought a, a few years back. And last year we decided to do something similar. Of course, it's much smaller. What you said, I resonate with that because it's tiny. <laughs> it's like, right. it's just hard to maneuver and do right. things in there. And But at the same time, it's pretty cool to be able to, to make a dramatic change to it by replacing maybe the flooring and painting it like you did. And the tile backdrop, I don't guess it was real tile though, right? It was like, um, what do you it's call that? It's peel and stick. It's peel and stick tiles that I used in the kitchen. And I also used uh-huh. it in the bathroom, but they stick great to the camper yeah. walls. So that was a blessing. I mean, that really set it off. I thought uh, just all all the changes you made. I was wondering, too, I saw where you were putting a slip cover on the couch, which I guess <laughs> the couch makes it to a bed. <laughs> well, the couch actually, actually splits down. It's a, called a jackknife couch. So when that's down flat, there's a Murphy bed that pulls over top of it. I haven't oh, really okay. showed Got that it. in pictures yet. But, I gotcha. um, yeah, that was my famous TikTok slip cover. <laughs> Well, that's one of the reasons why I asked what was the most frustrating part, because I didn't know if that would be because, I, you know, you showed in your, your TikTok and all of your stuff that you were vacuuming because it was peel, the, the old couch, the it material was, such was a mess. peeling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was, I mean, but you transformed it. Yeah, and it's so much better. And since I put the, I put polyfill with um, spray adhesive on it, which kind of glued it all back down again. So it's not such... A mess. It was literally like snowing every time you walked by it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Probably just have to wear one of your COVID masks while you're doing that. Oh my goodness. I was ready to put it in the fire pit, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you hang you hung in there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. Well, we appreciate um you chatting with us about your uh, camper because that was Thank a lot you. of fun to see. And I know I know listeners will want to go out to your account and see what that was all about if they haven't already. But we, we want to talk to you about your dresser makeover. Since people are listening, we do hope some people can go out and look at uh, the pictures on, on the Zebra blog or on your account, which, by the way, is Instagram's superb curb refurb for those who want to go out to Lynn's account. She can announce that at the end as well. But um, it, for those that are driving or working, Lynette, describe the before in detail, and then let's talk about what you did to it. Well, it was such a sad dresser, and I think that's kind of what drew me to it, as I always am drawn to the underdog. And when I saw it, it met everything that I always say no to. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was painted, and it was painted horribly. And it was dark blue. The whole body was dark blue. 
and the drawers were a high gloss yellow enamel. So <laughs> you can picture that. That was the exact opposite of what I ever do. So um, I went ahead and bought it and I thought, you know, I'm going to make this great because I knew it was a solid maple dresser. So I stripped down the drawer fronts, I sanded them all the way down, and when I saw the maple, I knew I had made the right choice. So everything was painted in white, except for um, the top was stained. I do a stain mix with um, dark walnut and weathered gray, and then the fronts of the drawers were a whitewash of white stain. Well, I guess maybe the only people who would have liked that dresser before is if you're a <laughs> University of Michigan fan, right? <laughs> it kind of reminded I mean, me of the Go Navy, too, because of the colors. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, it it is really, um, I'm just, I'm actually, I have the privilege of looking at it now and sort of flipping back and forth. And even that top drawer, that's sort of unique, isn't it? The top drawer with that embellishment or... The top drawer was my favorite. It kind of just had like a little curly cue in the wood. It was a different height. So I really wanted to showcase that. But it also had a piece at the bottom that I removed that really made it country looking because it was like a, a curly cue um, yeah. piece of wood. And as soon as I took that off, I think it just changed the whole look. It's funny because the, the before picture that you have... Um, because the, because of the, the dark blue, it almost has kind of a brown effect to it, but, um, uh, from the picture that I'm looking at, but that deep blue kind of blended in with the floor background. So I couldn't see that, um, shape at the bottom really well, but now that I'm looking at it, I see that change and that was really a wise thing to do there. Now, was that little piece, was that, um, just a piece that you popped off of there? Or did you have to cut that out? I used a jigsaw on the left and the right, and then there was just nails holding it into the bottom of the frame. And I just kind of <laughs> hit it a couple of times and out it came. <laughs> and you were like, yes, <laughs> yes, this is it. <laughs> yeah, that's when it's the happy dance time. Yeah. Now, tell me about choosing the hardware, because I think that's, you know, there's so many facets to furniture refinishing from what do you sand, what you not sand, what do you paint, what color do you paint it, top coats. The hardware is a big part, isn't it? Now, did you choose the hardware? Was that something that you had um, determined on the beginning? Or was that something that once you got to the, the you know, to the sanding it that you said, you know what, this is really, or maybe you'd fit, fully finished it before you got the hardware on? How did you make that choice? I usually always change the hardware because I don't think there's anything that I ever really get that I like the hardware on. So I usually use bin poles and I had these in stock in my warehouse and I thought that they would be perfect. So I just added some extra holes. I thought it really changed how it looked oh, yeah. and it made it more modern, which is what I usually try to do because I usually try to go for the modern farmhouse vibe. So I usually use the flat black hardware. It, it really does look nice. Now, do you struggle with a lot of times on your pieces, like what to keep and what to sell? Or is it pretty much you just sell everything? Oh, no, I sell everything. <laughs> do you really? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there might have been one or two that I've kept over the years. But if I was to keep everything I wanted, I wouldn't be able to move in my house because... <laughs> <laughs> I just love everything. Well, that's the reason why I asked that question, because, you know, when you're doing a piece, you're you're doing it, unless it's a custom piece, but you're doing it based on what you like and what you think looks nice. And so I would think it would be really hard to, to give up some of these uh, pieces at times. I think that's sometimes some of the excitement of refinishing furniture is when it sells and it sells quickly, because I think that one sold in like a minute. And that is very exhilarating for me. So that keeps me selling them. Wow. Now, where, where primarily do you sell your pieces once you get them finished and put them up for sale? I post everything cross-platform. So I show everything on my Instagram business page, Facebook business page. And then I also put things out on Marketplace. But mm -hmm. technically, everything sells either through my stories beforehand or from my Facebook business page because that's my local following. This question just kind of came into my mind, but I was thinking about when you said selling through social media and also selling on Marketplace, but do you make a strong effort with respect to your social media accounts to make sure that you get as much local following 
because the, it's broad based, right? I mean, you you've got right. people following you around the world, right? And that's right. the neat re- thing about the relationships with people within this community is that they're global. But it's probably pretty important to have a strong following locally, so that when you do put these pieces out, that you've got lo- potential you've got customers looking at it. Is there anything you do unique or special to try to grow your local following on those accounts? From day one, I've always had a Facebook business page and I used to do giveaways and it was mostly local people because that's how the giveaway would be handled. Mm -hmm. So that grew really, really fast and it just continues to grow. When I posted on Facebook, every pretty much everyone who comments or likes is local. And I Mm -hmm. live in a very big city, but yet it's small town. So it just makes it easier. And sometimes I'll post it on my personal Facebook page as well. I'll share it Mm -hmm. and make it public, which makes it go to friends, which then their friends see it if they comment, like, or share. Well, that, that is a really good point uh, for our listeners to, to think about, especially if they have an Instagram account, but not a Facebook page, because I guess Facebook is, tends to be a, a more localized uh, or local for your area. And as far as Instagram goes, I think a lot of my local followers transitioned over to Instagram because of the mm. story feature. <laughs> yeah. And I know Facebook is just now catching up with that. But the story feature really helped grow my business via Instagram. You gave us a surprise tidbit there. <laughs> <laughs> the that's more a, you story, the more people follow along to see what's going on. And that's where I pre-sale a lot of my items. So if someone is watching my stories, they usually get first dibs. And so then they're like, hey, I think I'd like to buy that piece if you haven't already sold it. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's exactly. great. Well, this particular dresser, Lynette, turned out incredible. Uh, Definitely accolades for you on that, which is why it got Zebra Drama. Thank you so much. That really means a lot to me. Well, listeners, stay tuned. We are going to take a quick break. But when we come back, Lynette is going to hang on to chat with us about power tools. So hang on. This podcast is sponsored by Zebra, makers of the high-end yet affordable line of application-specific paintbrushes. Zebra's new website is up at enjoyzebra.com, and we invite you to take it for a test drive. Test drive, because it's more than an ordinary product website, there is plenty of inspiration for you, as well as a really cool quiz that guides you to the ideal zebra paintbrush you need for your painting application. You can peruse the products that range from our paintbrushes, of course, to our latest apron designs, to our new paintbrush kit offerings. That, I might add, come in a really unique canvas bag, and any purchase over $35 or more means free shipping for those living in the United States. Anyone who follows Lynette's account will know that she isn't afraid to tackle anything, and that includes power cutting tools. Lynette, you really are quite an expert in using the right tools for the job. We might add that we think you know how to use a good paintbrush as well. Hint, hint. Uh, zebra paintbrushes. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely had to have a plug there, Lynette. <laughs> anyway, let's chat about power cutting tools. Have you always been good with using power tools or were you intimidated by them when you first started? I started using power tools when I was very young age because my dad used to build a lot of things and I was always hanging out in the garage with him. But in, then as I got older is when I decided that, hey, I'm going to get my own power tools. And at first, it is kind of intimidating. But I always think the more you use them, the easier it gets. By the way, quick question here. So how long have you been refinishing? And what were you doing before refinishing? I've been refinishing about 10 years now. I started back in 2011. And before that, um, I worked for the government. I have a computer science degree. And I created software for use on radar systems. Wow. <laughs> it, it, I, I find it's, I, I don't know, that's just so much fun for me to ask these questions because everybody, you know, mo- almost everyone comes from a different background than, than refinishing. I mean, even if it's, you know, some folks come from a creative background and then they transition into refinishing, but it's always fun to learn about the backgrounds. And oftentimes, they had nothing to do with refinishing or even the creative aspect. I mean, so this that's, is that's what cool. I always wanted to do. Really? But I just never did it. And then one day I decided in my 40s, I'm going to do this. So that's what I did. 
<laughs> well, you it sounds like you made the right decision because you're quite successful. That's that's really good here. And ten years. Yeah. That's a lot. I mean, you've got a lot of experience. Doesn't seem like it's been that long until I start looking back at photos, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well now, do you find that a lot of folks are nervous about using power tools? Yes, I do. And I try to help people and show people how to use power tools in my stories. I get a lot of requests for tutorials and I just kind of go over shop safety while I'm doing it. I think that's what makes people the most nervous is mm -hmm. the danger aspect of it. But really, as long as you're paying attention, I think it's really very safe. We'll, we'll dive into safety details in a little bit, but I think what you said and what we're talking about with respect to safety and being intimidated, I mean, really, because you, you know, you talk about your background when my dad was a contractor. So I grew up working with him over the years, and there is an intimidation level, I think, when it comes to especially power cutting tools. There's a fine line, isn't there, between respecting the tool and knowing what this tool can do and and being so scared that you could create an accident, being a bit fearful of it too because of what it can do. And I think that that helps you to be more safe and conscious of what where the blade is in relation to where your hands are and anything else. So I think that's, um, that's important to always know. But what would you say to those who want to use them but are just too fearful? I think the best way to start is just baby steps and start with a tool that maybe you're not as fearful of, um, mm -hmm. like a brad nailer. I think most people get scared when they hear circular saw or miter saw or jigsaw, anything saw related. <laughs> Yeah, the word saw. <laughs> right, right. You brought up a brad nailer. That's not a cheap investment. It, do you find that you use that like a lot and you're like, I could, now that you have it, you've been using it over the years, you can't do without it? True story. I just had to buy another one last night because the one that I've had forever quit working. So really? <laughs> honestly, I can't live without it. And I did a story about it and I showed everybody the cost of it and how much it's come down and I was really surprised. So I, yeah, I can't live without my Brad Nailer. That's my number one on my list. Let's talk then about, if that's your number one, what would be maybe number two and three? And let's think, let's think too in terms of power cutting tools. Let's assume that somebody's like, you know what? I'm okay with using the power cutting tools. I just need to learn a little more about them. Certainly focus on the safety aspects, but what power cutting tool do you think a furniture finisher should have if they don't have one right now? What would be the, the first recommendation? I would recommend a miter saw. I use that sometimes daily, just even if I'm just cutting something, even to build a new drawer glide or slide, it comes in so handy. And if you can't afford a miter saw, a circular saw is a good alternative. Yeah, and that's a really good point about the miter saw because I think there's an element of, I don't know, maybe apprehension when using a, uh, a circular saw because it's in your hand and you're moving it right. and then your other hand is holding and it's just, you you know, you got to make sure everything's in place right. But when you come to a miter saw, even though it can do just as much, you know, damage, <laughs> but a miter saw is stabilized. And so I think people maybe would feel more comfortable. Would you agree with that? I do agree. And you are in control of it because it's stationary. If you would just explain, well, maybe somebody doesn't know what a miter saw is. Explain how that benefits your business and what it, what you use it for. I do a lot of furniture building, so that is very useful. But if you don't build furniture, you could just recut a piece that you need to um, make an extra support inside of a dresser or a drawer, mm -hmm. a piece for a side for a drawer. There's so many things. I, I, I can't even list them all because <laughs> it is very useful. And I think if I didn't have my miter saw, I think I would be the same way with my Brad Nailer. I would have to go get another one. Yeah. And I started out with one that I got at a yard sale for $5. It doesn't have to be an expensive one. And I think just taking a piece of maybe even a two by four and just practice cutting over and over again, even if you're not using it for anything. That's mm -hmm. a good way to learn how it's going to work. Yeah, and I, I think in your stories as well, you mentioned uh, when, it, when it came to some of these power tools that, um, as you just said, you don't have to start off by going straight to a, you know, a Home Depot or Lowe's off the bat. 
You can right. go to Facebook Marketplace. Um, I think you even mentioned contacting relatives and friends and seeing if anybody has one maybe that you can use or, or buy. Or you know? borrow. And I even yeah. contact relatives and friends and say, hey, how about an Amazon gift card? And then you can save up to buy what you really want. <laughs> Yeah, I like that idea. That's really good. Good timing for that. Because as you mentioned uh, as well, and this just, hey folks, this is just an opportunity to make sure you follow Lynn's account because she gives a lot of great information. And one of those things that you talked about was that Black Friday is coming up. So there's a lot of good deals with these, a lot of these uh, tools. And this time of year, you can get even better deals if you buy a tool bundle. So if Mm. you don't have a drill, or if you do have a drill, sometimes it's better to have two or three. I do. But you could get a drill and a circular saw and a battery for very inexpensive. So it's something that I really recommend people look into. That's that's a really good point and um, something to look out for. Now, so we've, we've got the Brad Nailer, we've got the miter saw. As you go down your list, what else would you recommend? My other thing that I can't live without is a pocket hole jig. And you can use this to reattach things that come off on furniture by putting a little pocket hole in it and then screwing it in. And I do this all the time. Yeah. Now, do you, are you talking about like the, um, the Craig jigs? Yes. I use the Craig jig pocket holer. Yeah. And And you drill a hole and then you use their screws to connect two pieces together. That, uh, that's really helpful. It kind of keeps things, uh, in line and sure, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's very structurally sound. I use it a lot when I take bottoms off of dressers and I need to build a new frame, especially if I'm putting legs on it. I can just make a quick frame with the pocket holes and it's very secure. And just for our listeners, uh, I believe I'm not looking at it, but I think the Craig jig, if you want to look that up, that's spelled with a K, right? Yes, it is. K-R-E-G-G, I think something like that. K-R-E-I-G. There you go. And then jig. J-I-G, but it's the pocket hole. And there's different sizes. So you could start out with the one that costs $30 and there's some that go way up. I have the Foreman and I also have the K4. Very good. So we've got Brad Nailer, we've got the miter saw, we've got the pocket hole, the Craig pocket hole jig. What, What else have we got? I also use a jigsaw a lot. If like that little piece that I cut off the bottom Mm -hmm. of the dresser, you can just zip that right off. That's good to have. That one is scary. That scared me a lot in the beginning, <laughs> but <laughs> it um, it definitely does the trick. Now, now why just explain to the listeners, why did the jigsaw scare you? It has a tendency to jump around because of the way the blade is connected. For me, that is scary. But if you use it enough and you have the right blade on there, it, it is a very easy tool to use. And I use it a lot when I deconstruct deconstruct um, desks into side tables. Yeah, that, that is a good point about the jigsaw because, I mean, it's it's nice because it's not huge. It's manageable, right. but you have to make sure that your finger is not <laughs> on the, <laughs> the power button until, right. you're, until you're fully lined up because like you said, it's sort of a push-pull, I guess, action. Yeah, and the blade is really exposed. Yeah, the blade's exposed, and if you don't have it right in place... Like Lynette said, it can uh, jump around on you. What else would you recommend? Something I just started using a couple of years ago because I did have a big fear factor, and that's a table saw. And I finally conquered the fear just by doing it. I use that a lot to cut things down to size, especially if I'm building furniture. Now, table saws, those can be pretty expensive. They can be. I got mine on sale on Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> had it shipped, had it shipped right to my house, but um, it was a good investment for my business, and I try to invest in tools that help me do my job better. And I try to do this every year. Now, did your husband enjoy these tools as well? Um, he doesn't get to use my tools. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> see, that's what I was getting at. I was gonna, find, I was gonna dig deep here. I was gonna find out about that. <laughs> Honestly, that's why I have all my tools because I needed to be able to do this on my own. He used to help me a lot, and I would have to wait sometimes. And one day, I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna do this myself. And that's when I bought my miter saw, and I just went and got it, set it up, and did what I needed to do. No. I don't mean to pry, okay, but 
<laughs> but I kind of want to here. <laughs> so why can't he use your tools? Well, for one thing, they're in my warehouse, but he has kind of his own set. But, you know, they stay at work. Um, <laughs> I do occasionally bring them home, but yeah. Okay. I, I didn't know if maybe he was hard on them. Oh, no. Or, okay. No, I didn't know sometimes, if that was he, sometimes he claims they're his, and I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> you probably take a permanent marker and put your name somewhere. On oh, something. my God. I, I have my company initials on them. <laughs> oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> With a <the> Sharpie. Yeah. <laughs> you got it all figured out. He doesn't you got have me a there. You got me there. <laughs> Well, I know sometimes that uh, I, the other thing I thought was like maybe, especially on the smaller stuff, like let's say a jigsaw where maybe he uses it, doesn't put it back where it's supposed to go. Because that's rather frustrating, especially when you're working. You know, it's just not where, where you left it. <laughs> well, that's what's nice is I have my, it's it's nice because it's all at my shop. So <laughs> only I'm there. Well, that's that's a that's a benefit for you for sure because that that does. I mean, honestly, though, from a productive standpoint, there's nothing more frustrating when you're really in a productive mode and you're trying to find, or you just want to go grab something that is a part right. of your productivity, and your whole productivity gets slowed down because you can't find the tool or the whatever it is that you need. That's, uh, I would say, that's beyond frustrating for me. That is frustrating. I don't have oh. to worry about it because if it didn't get put back in its place, I know who did it, and it was me. <laughs> What else have we got on your list? Let's see. My my biggest thing is having multiple drills. I like to have my drills set up so that I don't I don't have to stop and put a different bit in, especially if I'm using a pocket hole jig. But really, I think that's everything that I have. I'm trying to visualize everything. Well, I was thinking in terms of like a router. Do you and to me that oh, would be I like Oh, I do have one. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. That would be further on down the line of necessity. I mean, I know you would use it, and, and you probably use yours a lot, but I guess it would depend on if you're sort of reforming a piece, right? Like if you're changing the edge or if it's a straight 45-degree or a, a corner. Yeah, I got one to use when I plank tops because I could go around okay. the edge and just round it over. But I didn't really get one of those until probably like last year. And that is an intimidating one too, but it's very simple to use. I've never really used a router. Um, is it pretty smooth as you're as you're moving around? I mean, you can guide it around, right? Mine isn't the big size router. I have what's called a trim router, so it's a lot smaller. It's battery operated, a lot easier to hold and handle, so it doesn't jerk around as much. It um, has a base that's made out of plexiglass. It's very easy to keep it supported, and you can see what you're doing because it's clear. So it does make it a lot easier. Oh, yeah, that, that sounds really good. And you know what? That is a great point because I see a lot of people using the plank top, you know, because they have to replace the top of a piece. Right. And, wow, I guess uh, that's, that, would be the, that would be the tool you would need definitely to give it that uh, a cove edge or, or, you know, that sort of shaped edge around the, the, uh, around the plank top to smooth like it out. Like an OG. Yeah, the OG mm -hmm. bit looks really good. You can get a whole little bit tool set and change it out and just pick what you want. Well, so that's your list then. I mean, that's a that's, lengthy list. I mean, I, I think I have just about everything I need. I don't really ever go beyond that. And if I need it, then I go get it. So, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, now that that is like, um, that's just a really good list. But before we close this uh, segment, I do want to talk safety. And I just sort of mentioned this before, but it's a bit of a disclaimer, you know, because we always want to provide information here that's helpful, insightful, and encouraging. And that is no less with power cutting tools, of course. And if you just don't feel right about using them, then don't use them. But having Lynette on to talk about them is so you can garner as much information as possible to make the right decision for you. And so we hope that's uh, what this segment has provided for you. But <clears throat> Lynette, talk safety considerations and guidelines uh, so, so folks uh, have an idea of what they need just to make sure they're they're comfortable and they're taken care of from a safety standpoint when using these tools. I really am an advocate for safety all the time. And when I'm at work, I have my safety gear on all the time. So when I'm using power tools, I always wear safety goggles. I always wear a mask because a lot of the wood that you're cutting can be toxic and you don't want to breathe that in. And a lot of people don't think about that. Mm -hmm. And I also always wear steel toe boots. I'm 
adamant about it and people always laugh. But if you drop something on your foot, you don't have to worry about it. And you could even drop a tool on your foot. I don't feel safe unless I have them on. And I also wear gloves, like a grip type glove when I'm working with wood. And that can also protect your hands just in case anything were to come close. But I think a lot of times it's just being aware of what you're doing, how you're doing it, and not getting too close to something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And staying, just really being focused on the task that you're, you're not thinking about maybe another, you know, refinishing project or when I get done with this, I got to go do that. But really just focusing your mind on what you're doing at hand. Now you mentioned safety goggles, any kind of style or anything uh, recommend for others? The ones that I use have a foam interior edge. So if you have a lot of sawdust, it can't just go on the side of the goggle and go in your eye. I really prefer those. They, they fit just like sunglasses and kind of look just like sunglasses. I would definitely recommend getting those, that type. And what about the mask? I prefer the 3M full, um, it's a half mask respirator. And depending on what I'm doing, I either use with the pink cartridges for fumes or with the regular gray, which is for more like particles. And I wear it regardless. <laughs> <laughs> so you stick to your safety guidelines. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. if you do this every single day and think about how many years I've been doing this, you know, that's a lot of stuff that you could breathe in that's definitely toxic and not good for you. And you, and you really do have to make a habit of it, don't you? Because, I mean, it, it, just that one time that you choose not to wear your safety glasses or put on your gloves or have right. your steel, steel toe boots on can be the time where you have the accident. Right. Totally. Well, really great information on cutting tools and safety and what you recommend, Lynette. We really appreciate it. If you would, share your Instagram account with our listeners. My Instagram account is Superb Curb Refurb, and it's the same on, on all social media. So if you're looking for me on Facebook or wherever, it's all the same. Well, thanks so much for that, Lynette. Happy refinishing. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Today's Ask a Refinisher question comes from Melinda with Yellow Creek Interiors. Melinda had several great questions, one of which was answered a few weeks back in episode 36 with Katie Cloud on when to transition your hobby to a business. Today's question is for Jen with Perfectly Imperfect Furniture Restorations. Hi, Jen. You ready for another refinishing mm -hmm. question? Yes, anytime. <laughs> okay, well, here's Melinda. Hi, Lane. This is Melinda from Yellow Creek Interiors, and my question is for Jen at Perfectly Imperfect Furniture. Hi, Jen. How do we engage a local business to display or use our pieces in their stores? And when it comes to commission, how much should we expect to pay them? Well, hi, Melinda. Um, I think that's a really good question. So from my experience, I can tell you what I've done I would say a few years ago, once my business kind of got up and running, that's when I first started engaging with local businesses. And I think what I did is just go in there and talk to them. I would come armed with some business cards and have some pictures of your pieces ready to show them. Maybe ask to speak with the owner. And like I said, that's what I did. I found a few shops that I thought would be a good fit for my pieces. For example, one was mostly a florist, um, but they also had lots of home decor and things like that. The other one was mostly, mostly home decor items of all different all different types. Um, but I just approached the owners, told them what I did, showed them some examples of my work and asked if they would be interested in using my pieces either, you know, as display or if I could put them up for sale in their stores. And luckily both of those places were interested and um, they, they took the pieces that they wanted, I guess, because I think at the time I had several, it kind of showed them what I had available and they took what worked for their space and, um, you know, for their aesthetic. Um, I would say the commit, what you can expect for the charge, what they will charge is anywhere from 
20 to 30 percent. Um, at first, I was a little bit scared by that because I thought, wow, if I'm losing 20 to 30 percent, that's a lot when a piece is only maybe, maybe I only had it priced at $200 or something like that. However, um, I remember one of the business owners telling me, you know, I'm going to charge 20%, but then you should just mark up your piece by 20%, which I did. Wow. So that's, that's a really good way to compensate for the potential loss if you don't mark it up. What about, um, do you think there's a need for a contract with a store? You know, I never did one. However, looking back, and if I were to do this again, I feel like I would have a contract. I feel like you Mm -hmm. do have to have something to protect yourself or, you know, and maybe if it's not even a formal contract, just, just something in writing, I think would be helpful. I had Mm -hmm. good experiences. However, I have heard from other furniture refinishers who have not. And so I think that just having something in writing to protect yourself certainly couldn't hurt. It's definitely not a bad idea. Now, when you did that, Jen, did you, was there any concerns at all about damaging your piece getting damaged? You know, I mean, when it's in a store, let's say a clothing store, whatever it may be, you know, people are looking at it. Maybe they walk by and accidentally hit their purse on it and the, and the something metal, you know, scratches it. Mm-hmm. What, what about that? Cause I'm sure some folks are thinking, you know, I just don't want to get my piece damaged, you know? Right. And honestly, when I first took my pieces there, that thought didn't even cross my mind. I can't even believe I, now I can't even believe that it didn't. Um, I think I was just so new at it and excited to get my work out there and have it be seen that I didn't even think that any, anything like that could happen. Um, however, it did happen to me. Um I had a dining set at one of the stores and it was placed in a front window or a back window where the sun like beat down on it constantly. Unfortunately, I think they had put like a runner over the tabletop and then, you know, to set items on top of it so that they wouldn't scratch the wood. However, I guess they didn't think about that constant blaring sun, you know, basically sun bleaching the table. So, um, there was like a diagonal line from where the runner was, where it was like completely sun bleached. And so, so it was damaged that, and that's not something that's easily fixable. I haven't even fixed it yet. (laughs) That was like two years ago. And I think I was so, you know, just bummed about it that I put it in storage and thought I'll, I'll deal with this at a later date, but obviously yeah. that's something that the table is going to have to be completely resanded and restained. You can't just add stain mm-hmm. on top of a piece that's already been lacquered. So, but it was a learning experience for me on, you know, on a couple different levels. One, you know, maybe whatever top coat I was using wasn't the best top coat yeah, <laughs> because right. I, I didn't even realize that something like that could happen. Again, this is, this was in my newer, newer days. And also just to, to think of that, to think of when you are taking your pieces to a place like that to keep things like that in mind it's not just customers who might bump into it or spill on Mm -hmm. it or you know it could be where they're placing the piece is it going to be placed in uh, bright sunlight or a a place where there could potentially be i don't know water damage or something like that Mm -hmm. so i think you do have to take those things into consideration and i you know i don't think like minor dings and scratches, of course, I think that just comes with the territory. And that's something that I am definitely willing to take that risk in order to get my piece out there in order to get exposure, make a possible sale, you know, those are things that I can easily fix. But I would say think about the things that would be a bigger, a bigger concern, like what happened with my table, or maybe if even if like they were moving the piece and they dropped it and a leg snaps off Mm -hmm. or something like that, that's not easily fixable. So I do think you have to take that into consideration. And that's where, you know, maybe a contract would, would come in handy. Yeah. And you, you touched on it just a few seconds ago, Jen, when you said exposure, because I think that's the bottom line. It's not just about selling that one particular piece, but it's about understanding that there are, depending on what kind of store you place your piece in, a lot of foot traffic, a lot of people are looking and viewing and seeing that piece that you created. And so you don't know what that may lead to with commission pieces or just, just getting your name out and building brand awareness with your, with your refinishing name. So that's, that's, I think it's a great idea. 
And uh, it's, it's one of those things, I suppose, that you don't want to put so many stipulations on it that you don't do it. <laughs> um, right. It's just about, you know, it's about remembering that this primarily is about exposure and building brand awareness and letting your community know that, hey, there's a phenomenal refinisher in town that can do really good work. And so that's a good way to do that. And I, I guess one question I would think, too, uh, as well, Jen, is how much time would you allow a piece to sit in the store before you remove it or, or exchange, you know, for another piece? You know, I think that's something that's probably individual between you and the store owner. Um, for me, there was pieces that sat there, you know, a year or more. And I didn't mind because just like you were saying, it is more about exposure. And at that time for me, it was, it was definitely more about exposure because I was new and trying to grow my business. So I would offer pieces that weren't selling for me mm -hmm. and they were just going to either sit in my home or sit in my storage unit. So getting no exposure. So I chose pieces like that to take there because I thought, well, they're just sitting in my storage unit anyway, at least this way someone is seeing it. And if they don't necessarily yeah. like this piece or this piece doesn't sell, that's okay because my name is getting out there. One of the things that I did is I always uh, put, I asked the store owner if she would put a stack of my business cards on the piece. So I just mm -hmm. got a little like business card holder that would sit on top of the piece so people could just take it with them. I have gained clients that way. I got commissioned work that way. So even though that particular piece may not have sold, it did benefit me in the long run. So I guess my answer also to that question is just kind of work that out with the um, with the business owner. If you're okay to let it sit indefinitely and they're okay with that, I would say don't worry about putting a time frame on it. Um, however, I remember I would take a piece down there and it would sit for a couple months and then I would start getting inquiries about it again. That's where it got a little bit tricky because I would send them to the store. But if they saw on my previous post that it was, you know, $200, now they go to the store and it's marked up, then it, that kind of was a little bit of a, I don't know, sticky situation, I guess, because, um, mm. because of that markup. But I don't know. I, I think it's so situational on on you, on the store owner. And I think it just I think it just depends. And I think if you if you work it right, even within your contract and in your presentation to the store owner, it's going to be an advantage for both involved, because if you've done, you know, if you've got a beautiful piece that you've refinished and to have that in their store that goes with their store decor and whatever it is that they're selling and, and, and they incorporate that into their store, I'm sure that's going to be a huge advantage for them as well. And on top of that, if they're making commission, you know, why not? <laughs> it sounds like a good deal for both. Right. Absolutely. Well, that, that was a phenomenal question, Melinda. We appreciate you taking the time to, to record that question for Jen. Jen, thanks as always for your incredible contribution to this community. You inspire us and inform us in multiple ways. If you would, provide your contact information for those that would like to reach out to you. Sure. I'm on Instagram and Facebook, Perfectly Imperfect Furniture Restoration. Very good. Thanks so much, Jen, for taking the time to join us today. Sure. Thank you so much. We are so grateful for each of you, not only for listening to this podcast, of course, but also for using our paintbrushes. We love it when you tag us in your stories and posts showing what applications you're using zebra brushes on. And that is not just furniture refinishing, but also painting your homes. We will always make it our priority to highlight your furniture refinishing works of art on our zebra painting Instagram account and Facebook page. But we also want to make sure we highlight notable home projects as well. If you have used your zebra paintbrush on a home project and you want us to check it out, make sure you tag your pieces with zebra inspo. That's hashtag Zebra Inspo, Z-I-B-R-A-I-N-S-P-O. The Zebra Review Monthly Contest has been announced for November, and the theme is Earth Tones. As we see the final leaves fall from the trees, we notice all the beautiful tones of browns and grays of the earth. We encourage you to use those neutral tones on your pieces, as well as feel free to show some bare wood entirely or partially. Use the hashtag the Zebra Review and you'll have your piece before a judging panel as they will choose three winners. The judging panel also includes guest judge Jenna with Happy Valley Restorations. She was our first place winner for September. Great prizes await the winners from mud paint, D. Lawless hardware, surf prep sanding, and zebra paint brushes. All pieces refinished from January 1st, 2020 to November 30th, 2020 are eligible for entry. 
We would love for many more people to discover the Zebra Before and After podcast. Please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast directory. It really does make a huge difference in the rankings. And thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Zebra Blogs Before and After Furniture Refinishing Podcast. Today's episode is also featured on the zebrablog.com along with contact information for today's guest. Your comments and suggestions for future episodes are always welcome, and we encourage you to share those by clicking on the podcast slide in our header at the zebrablog.com. That's zebra with an I blog.com. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and happy refinishing.